Ah, America. Home of the free, NASCAR racing, and close talkers. Where muscle cars and motorheads can be found at every diner and every red light, each ready to race at any moment. You could say we're passionate about our motorsports, but back in the 1970s, the car enthusiast scene was grim. There was an oil crisis, gas shortages, and a recession to name a few. President Nixon decided to put a nationwide speed limit in place. But what happens when you try to limit lead-footed thrill seekers? I mean, look what happened when they tried to limit us during Prohibition. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. Turns out that telling speed freaks to slow down, uh, it doesn't go as planned either. Laws get broken, illegal street races happen, and one man's friendly competition is turned into a protest against the government. It's a wild story of speed, rebellion, and a testament to our love of the open road, and how an act of sticking it to the man created one of the greatest achievements in motoring history. This is The Cannonball Run. It's not just a movie. It's a real life, no holds barred outlaw race across America from New York to California. Many believe this is a car race from sea to shining sea, but it was actually first run on a motorcycle. It was completed by a man named Erwin Cannonball Baker in 1914, and it took him over 11 days to make the trip. He then did it in a car in 1933 and set the record at around 53 hours. He held that record for 38 friggin' years. Side note, Irwin also won the very first motor race ever held at Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1909. But in 1971, there's this guy at Car and Driver magazine named Brock Yates, and he really hated how speed limits were being lowered. So what does he do? He and his son map out a cross-country drive where drivers can go as fast as they want and offers no money prize, only the pride of winning this outlaw rebellion against limits. Later, a cobbled together trophy was donated by the SK Tool Company to give to the winner. Now, while there were no real rules, there was a gentleman's agreement that the vehicle you entered would be driven the entire distance. No transporting it on another vehicle, no swapping out for an identical second vehicle hidden near the finish, etc. Speeding tickets received along the way were the driver's responsibility. Crews carried thousands of dollars in cash to pay the fines as quickly as possible because although the car was stopped, the clock was still ticking. In respect of Irwin, Brock originally called it Cannibal Baker, Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash. Yeah, try fitting that on the plaque. Two other men went for the initial ride, and in May of that year, they completed the run in just under 41 hours while driving a Dodge van named Moon Trash 2. This was the catalyst, and just six months later, the official race was about to start. Now this time, eight cars and 23 excited petrol heads accepted the challenge. There were all types of cars here, from motorhomes to Cadillacs. Some of them got pretty creative with their rides. Like the Chevy van containing a crew called the Polish Drivers of America, who were all wearing fireproof suits, and it also housed five huge 55-gallon barrels of fuel. Now they were allowed to start first, claiming they had the pole position. Yeah, it was a bad joke, but they weren't wrong. No one contested the poles, but I'm guessing it was also due to being afraid that if someone sneezed inside that thing, it would instantly go up in flames. Another team took inspiration from the previous winner and strapped a massive 190 gallon fuel tank to the back of a similar Dodge van, and they also modified the engine and drivetrain a bit. Now, of course, someone showed up in a fully stocked Ferrari. Others included an AMC AMX, MGB, Cadillac DeVille, and a Travco motorhome. I mean, imagine you're driving this pricey exotic car and you line up next to a damn house on wheels. I, I, if, uh, w w what is happening? Then again, this was still new to almost everyone. No one really knew what worked best. Sure, families took road trips and businessmen and truckers drove cross country for work, but not many people actually raced from one end to the other. The first five cars to finish the inaugural race were all within two hours of each other, which is just amazing. And the bone stock Ferrari finished first. It was driven by American racing legend, Dan Gurney, who won the 24 hours of Le Mans in 1967, and Yates was the co-pilot. After more than 24 hours, the motorhome limped in to finish last. But how awesome is that though? 
Everyone who entered eventually made it the 2,900 miles from Red Ball Garage in New York City to Portofino Inn at Redondo Beach, California. For the 72 race, no time records were broken, but it was the only year an American car brand won, with the winners finishing in a Cadillac DeVille. The race was put on hold in 1973 due to the Arab oil embargo, and again in 1974 because of the enforcement of the 55 mile per hour speed limit. But that didn't stop retired U.S. Army Colonel Jim Atwell and Porsche salesman Chick Stanton from doing a practice run. They finished and took a lot of notes along the way. Then in 1975, they're invited to the race and show up in a brand new Porsche 911 Carrera along with a tape recorder. They end up recording the entire run, and to this day, it is the only live recording of any of the original races. Averaging 74.5 miles per hour, they play 7th out of 18 cars. The winners are Jack May and Rick Klein driving a Ferrari Dino 246 GTS, and their time is 35 hours and 53 minutes, beating the record held by Gurney and Yates from 1971 by only one minute. The final run of the original Cannonball Baker races was run in 1979 and actually started in Darien, Connecticut and ran to Los Angeles, California. The winners set the record in a Jaguar XJS with a time of 32 hours and 51 minutes. This would stay the official record for years as Yates closed down the competition, but a few years later, a new competition was opened to continue the rebellion. With all the hype and attention the races were getting, a film director named Hal Needham, who was also Yates co-driver in the 1979 run, decided to make a movie about the madness of the Cannonball Baker. While the film was cheesy and also got some horrid critical reviews, it also helped the world see this amazing feat. The opening credits of this movie showed the awe-inspiring Lamborghini Countach, and many people, Americans, got to see and hear this masterpiece. Yates was not a fan of the movie, even though Needham had him script the entire movie, but he was also unaware of the cult classic he was helping create. The original script was intended for the late legend Steve McQueen, but Needham finally convinced Yates to let Burt Reynolds play the lead role in place of McQueen. Not many know that while the movie was a bit over-exaggerated, the scenes were all pretty true to the original antics. A team dressed as nuns to evade a ticket, another dressed as priests, and the scene of the cops pulling over the ambulance, all of that actually happened. They even used the same Dodge ambulance from the 1979 run in the film. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch just to see the madness of it all. With the end of the Cannonball Run, people were left hungry for another cross-country challenge. So Rick Doherty, who ran in the 1975 and 1979 races, organized the U.S. Express and promoted it by using ads in magazines. The 1980 run ran from Brooklyn, New York to the beach in Santa Monica. Doherty won the first U.S. Express in a Mazda RX-7 with co-driver Will Wright. Yes, the guy who created SimCity and The Sims. In 81, the race ran from Long Island, New York to Emeryville, California. It was won by a Porsche 928 with what many said was luck because they had special plastic tire chains that allowed them to drive through the early snowfall that closed much of the road for everyone else. 1982 was riddled with tons of speeding tickets, but they ran the same route. The final run in 83 saw a slight change ending in Newport Beach, California. Although the race was longer than the Cannonball, the fastest time recorded was 32 hours and 7 minutes. That's 44 minutes faster than the fastest Cannonball, and the record was held for over two decades until it was broken in 2006. Many amazing records and claims of extraordinary runs have happened since. 2006 saw a team set a transcontinental record of 31 hours and 4 minutes using a BMW M5. There was a Ferrari 550 that was full of extra gas tanks that claimed a 31 hour and 59 minute run of the original 1979 route. 2013 was legendary due to a team making a 28 hour run in a Mercedes CL55. They used a dedicated in-car spotter to peek ahead at the road to avoid all obstacles possible. Shortly after, another team used a car spotter and clocked a 27-hour run, again in a Mercedes, but this was the E63. During the 2020 pandemic, many teams took advantage of the almost empty roads, and there have been all kinds of claims, from the Audi S6 disguised as a cop car, to the solo driver who rented a Ford Mustang, 
added a bunch of fuel cells, and completed the run in under 25 hours. Now some argue this run could not be confirmed, but it's amazing either way. The Cannonball Run remains an emblem of rebellion, competition, and the relentless pursuit of adventure. While technology may have transformed the way we travel, it can never replace the thrill of a daring race, the taste of victory, or the sense of friendly competition among fellow road warriors. As we navigate an ever-changing world, the legacy of the Cannonball Run reminds us of the importance of embracing passions, defying the norms, and cherishing the freedom to embark on our own daring adventures.